morning, church. I would like to request all of you to uh, take your phones. I have shared a link in uh, church WhatsApp group, in the fellowship group. Uh, please open the link. And um, uh, there is a question. It will, I mean, the link will lead you to a question. And please do answer there. Uh, may I request Vijay to present the slide over here? Yes. Uh, please open the church WhatsApp group. You will find a question. It says, uh, how the church can bring the kingdom of God on earth? This is the question. You will have options, two words you can put. Please uh, fill them. And those who are not part of uh, church WhatsApp group can open menti uh, sorry, mentimeter.com. Okay. And enter the code 77309660. You can open menti.com or mentimeter.com, no problem. Both of, both of them will lead you to the same. And enter the code 77309660. I request all of you to participate and share your opinions. Wonderful. Keep your answers coming. How can church bring the kingdom of God on this earth? Wonderful. Okay, we can see somebody answered by praying. We can bring the kingdom of God. Showing love. Showing love. Transformation. Living in His will. Wonderful. Your answers are really good. Please keep, the, keep your answers coming. By praying, by... Christ brings it. Participating. Keep your answers coming. If any of our children wants to participate, take your parents' phone and you can try again. You also can try. Living the life of Jesus by showing Jesus' love. Jesus taught us to pray. And by understanding God's will, we can bring the kingdom of God on earth. Okay? Sharing the word. Wonderful. Come on, church, we are 40 people here. <laughs> uh, anything new? By being united to Christ, wonderful. I guess this is an opportunity for pastor to take test for what they are preaching every Sunday. <laughs> Okay, keep, your, keep sending your answers. Perhaps uh, uh, later we can see the full, um, uh, I mean, the slide with the full answers. Thank you so very much for participating. All your answers are wonderful. A um, couple of days ago, I had a conversation with somebody who were talking about the social, um, uh, what we'll call, the, the violence that is taking place in a particular area in our country uh, where... Um, uh, two ethnic groups were fighting against each other and they started, uh, the person, he started blaming uh, one of the group who are quite major, I mean, big in numbers over there are Christians. Why the Christians are not bringing the kingdom of God in this land? And he, they are blaming the Christians are not bringing the kingdom here. We Christians should uh, be in power so that we can bring the values of the kingdom into this earth when we Christians could establish a government where uh, all Christian leaders are installed in power and position and, and uh, they, he started saying that Christians should be in all governmental authority uh, and good position so that they can bring the Christian values and uh, uh, in fact they can establish the kingdom of God on this 
earth or especially in this country. Um, listening to that, I felt uh, it sounds good, but the reality is it is a little distorted. That's what I felt. You know, we ought to take the values of the kingdom into this earth or into, we have to take the values of the kingdom wherever we work or wherever we are. And um, uh, next thing is, are we Christians have to establish the kingdom of God? Because the person started blaming, saying you Christians are not establishing the kingdom of God here. Are we Christians are liable, are uh, responsible to bring the kingdom of God on this earth? In order to understand that, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of um, uh, people who are mentioned in the Bible. These are called the sons of thunder. Question to Sunday school children, who are called sons of thunder? Who are sons of thunder? Oh, James and John. Wonderful, you passed my test. And <laughs> Yes, James and John are the sons of thunder. And these are the children of Zebedee, a fisherman. You can find it in Matthew, two, Matthew chapter 2. They were the third and fourth in the list of Jesus' apostles. And James and John, James and John were among the disciples who witnessed Satan falling like a star. Jesus sent his disciples to minister in various parts of Israel. The disciples went and they have uh, performed so many miracles and they witnessed. When, when they went and ministered, the Satan was falling down like a star, which Jesus also commended. And then uh, we can find James and John are part of Jesus' very core group. Okay, And Jesus has uh, many disciples outside and 70 disciples who are always following him. Among them, 12 of them with him, always 24-7. Among these 12, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, were with Jesus even in his very personal moments. Jesus has taken these three people even uh, as he was going to spend personal time with his father. So these two were part of such a core group of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the person who named these people as sons of thunders. We can find it in Mark chapter 3. Verse 17. And these are the two people who asked Jesus for some special position in the kingdom when Jesus establishes it. And according to, Ma, according to Matthew, it was uh, G, uh, James and John's mother who came to Jesus and asked for special positions uh, for her children. But in Mark, it is the disciples, they themselves. They, take, they ask Jesus, we want you to do uh, whatever we ask. And Jesus says, please tell me what you want me to do. And they said, give us special position. Give us a place uh, to sit in your kingdom. And I would like to take Mark because I want to blame these two guys today. So <laughs> I would like to take the words of Mark. These two guys wanted to have special, special positions uh, in, the king, in Jesus' kingdom. <coughs> Jesus' kingdom. And these two guys, uh, they suffered persecution for being witness to Jesus Christ or being witness uh, of Jesus Christ. And James was the first martyr we can find in the Bible. In um, Acts chapter 12, we find he's the first, sorry, he's the second uh, martyr and he's the first among the, uh, um, so first martyr among the apostles. Okay. Uh, so he was a quite a prominent fellow, so uh, Herod wanted to kill him. And uh, the interesting thing is he was not killed by crucifixion, crucifixion or so he was not killed by stoning, and, but he was killed by, be, uh, like by the sword, which means be, beheaded. Be, beheading is not a Jewish punishment, it is a Roman punishment. Herod was a Jewish king and uh, who was leading the Jewish country. He performed this execution in Roman style in order to find favor from Rome. Okay, so for political reasons, he was martyred. And John was the apostle who was, uh, uh, he was not a martyr. He died out of uh, age, natural death. And, but he was exiled because of political unrest, because of the political reasons. He was uh, exiled to Patmos and there he lived and wrote his letters and uh, books, whatever he wrote and then he died, he was exiled by Rome for 
political reasons. This is a story we can find about these two uh, apostles of Jesus Christ. What we're going to do is we're going to focus on one particular incident that happened in their lives and then uh, try to get connected to some other scriptures and so that we can understand the relationship between the kingdom and the church. So the, one of the uh, famous and uh, well-known incidents that is Matthew chapter 20 where uh, Zebedee's James and, uh, sorry, Z James and uh, John's mother came to Jesus and asked for special uh, positions. So Matthew 20 verse 20 onwards it is written like this. Then the mother of Zebedee's, uh, Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him and he said to her what do you wish? She said to them grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. So uh, this particular incident happened just right before Jesus was going to Jerusalem, we all, which we talk about triumphal entry and we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Jesus is going to establish the kingdom. That was the uh, atmosphere over there. And in that moment, these are asking Jesus, grant us to, so that we may sit one in the left, the other in the right. The question is, Jesus, you are going to become king. You are going to establish your, your kingdom. You are going to be on top. Who is the second? You are the first. And who is the next? I want to be the next. I, if you are the president, I want to be your prime minister. So that's the question. That's the request the disciples of Jesus made to. Uh, the disciples of Jesus made. But Jesus answered them and said, <coughs> You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. My question here to Jesus is, if it is something not in your hand, why don't you simply confess it? Why should you ask all these answers? Why should you ask these questions? Huh? If it is not in your hand, thank you. If it's not in your hand, say it's not in your hands. And why should you ask? Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Are you able to baptize? the baptism I was baptized with, we know very well this is clearly he is indicating his sufferings. And in fact, after asking this question, they said, yes, we are going, we are able to do it. It looks like Jesus was surprised by their answer and said, okay, you, you think that you are going to uh, drink the cup and you are going to be baptized with the baptism I was baptized with. And indeed, you are going to do that. And we know the disciples suffered for Jesus. And they died for Jesus. And then he said these statements. The reason he said these is because he wanted to help them to understand the situation and what does it mean to be high or what does it mean to be second or the second best in his kingdom or to be in the higher positions. First thing he said, to, he said to them is, actually when we read scripture, very important points only are mentioned. There are a lot of things we, where we have to uh, read between the lines, but according to the rest of the scripture. Okay? Here, Jesus, first thing Jesus said was, you do not know what you are asking. He wanted to tell them, you are expecting a kingdom with a perspective. And the kingdom I'm talking about is quite different from that. You, don't, you do not know what you're asking. In fact, it is about baptism and the kind of suffering I go through. They said, I want to be in the second position. He said, you don't know what you're going to be. And then he said, it's about suffering. Somebody, I heard like somebody has prayed regularly, uh, Jesus, make me more like you. And the next day he was crucified. Uh, it is like that. <laughs> Okay. He was telling them, you did not understand what you are asking about. 
and then he started explaining in the later part of the conversation. Um, 20, verse 24 onwards, uh, sorry, uh, uh, verse 24 onwards. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Here he is explaining the picture. When you talk about leader and authority, what does Gentiles do? Gentiles try to overtake the people and take, try to take control over the people. They want to exercise authority over the people. And then he says, yet it shall not be so among you. You are asking for the second position by thinking that you are going to exercise authority, but it's, it should not be so. And he says, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Here he changed the picture completely. And you know what? If you read the same chapter, Matthew chapter 20, workers and vineyard, you know the parable, right? The, it, it ends with the statement saying, the first will be last, the last first. Chapter 19 you take. Again, there, there is again, he speaks about the rich young ruler who came and asked Jesus, how can I inherit the kingdom of God? There he said, it ends with, the first will be the last, the last one. Look at the theme, the kind of theme it is being continued from chapter 19 and chapter 20. And it is, ends with this saying where Jesus says, if you want to be first in the kingdom, you should be the last. The first, because the first will be the last, the last. First, because this kingdom is not about exercising authority over your brother, but this kingdom is about washing the feet of your brother. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. And he was telling them, kingdom of this world exercises authority over others, but kingdom of God uh, serves people. And not only we look at, when we read this scripture, we think only John and James and ask this this request to disciples. But it, in reality, it is not. John and James are not the only people who were having this perspective, but the entire G disciples of Jesus also. And after seeing Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and before his ascension, the disciples also asked him, "Lord, when you come back this time, are you going to establish the kingdom to Israel?" What are they asking? They are asking for the same. What John and Jabadi asked, are you going to establish the same kingdom? What kind of kingdom are they looking? They are looking for a kingdom where Jesus becomes like Caesar and rules over other nations and uh, who becomes a political kingdom. The way, but the reality is the way of the kingdom is entirely different. Here the masters are called to serve. The first will be the last, the last first. And uh, I just remember one, of, one incident, one of my friends, uh, it's been uh, nearly 10 years ago, uh, who came to me and said, uh, he's so very uh, curious about this gift of prophecy. I was teaching in some charismatic groups those days. Uh, he was very uh, curious about gift of prophecy. He wanted to have the gift of prophecy and we were praying for it because uh, there was a great demand in, the, in Hyderabad city for prophets those days. You all can, you all witness, uh, witness it, I guess, right? Everyone goes and puts the name prophet, prophet so and so, and they go to the home and say, I can see the blessings of the blanket which was covering your house and what not. They will be speaking whatever they want and wherever they go, they get very great respect and great treatment. And this fellow said he wanted to become the prophet like a so and so person. And uh, we had a call, because he was keep uh, telling me the same thing. So one day I told him, you know, uh, if you read the scripture, God asked prophets to do some crazy stuff. Once he asked uh, Ezekiel to shave his head. Okay. Once he asked him to carry all the bag as if he is going somewhere and go to his garden and dig a, uh, dig a pit and bury that. Bury his luggage there. And... One, he asked one of the prophets to marry a prostitute who was in his who was continuing in her profession. So whoa. I'm not sure if God tomorrow if God asks you to eat the dung you have to eat if you are a prophet. <laughs> Let me tell you, that fellow stopped <laughs> seeking to become a prophet. 
he thought becoming a prophet means a great honor everybody will respect him that was the picture he had but all the prophets we see in the scripture they were been rejected they were been kicked they were been uh, exiled many of them were been tortured but many more most of the times we also get similar pictures the moment we talk about the kingdom of god and these disciples the sons of thunders are so wonderful you know uh, they wanted to at any cost they are expecting jesus to become the king and uh, they saw okay jesus is the right person because we could see the miraculous powers in jesus he could stop the storm okay even uh, wind is listening to him he is walking on the water he is uh, uh, multiplying the bread and with five bread he fed 5000 people if he becomes the king with two bread he can feed the entire nation okay there will be there will not be any economical crisis in the country no employment issue everything will be sufficient no storms also in the country that's what they expected so at any cost we need to make him kingdom in order to make him kingdom even we will be ready to fight for him with the sword they were carrying the swords of course and we can see some incidents also about that and let me show you one incident which was so oh, sorry uh, which was so crazy uh, that you can find in luke chapter 9 verse 51 to 56 okay gee, this is also same time jesus was about to go to jerusalem and these people went to various villages and said jesus has become the king and uh, the kingdom of god has come and uh, it, this is what happened my luke 9 51 to 56 now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to jerusalem this is what jesus has in mind i have to go to jerusalem and complete the crucifixion and other things and send messengers before his face and as they went they entered a village of the samaritans to prepare for him but they did not receive jesus because his face was set for the journey to jerusalem then what these people are saying say and when his disciples james and john saw this they said lord do you want us to command the fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as elisa did <laughs> they did not receive jesus and they want they said they want to command the heaven to f- rain fire upon them because they were looking in some kind of uh, miraculous power okay but jesus said but he turned and rebuked them and said you do not know what manner of spirit you are of for the man, son of man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them and they went to the village they went to another village so they want to bring the fire from heaven to uh, destroy them completely so that jesus can become the king over this village also they were looking at miraculous things and if they are modern day people they would say jesus you you just permit us i'm going to shoot a nuclear bomb upon them same thing this is a first century nuclear bomb fire from heaven they want to establish the kingdom by violence and we know the history even christian history where we have used violence to establish the kingdom in the 11th and uh, uh, 10th century 9th 10th and 11th centuries which for which we are still are being blamed and even and the funniest thing is even in india people are asking about it now previously i never had this question now people are asking about crusades for a eternal mark we we put it on christianity because we wanted to establish god's kingdom by force by violence the same thing sons of thunder wanted to do and they were suggesting this is the kingdom of god this is for the sake of god we are doing it because see look in the bible also there are certain places we can find violence for god the head thing is in, we need to we should, when when people say that we can find violence for god in the bible a lot of extremists also using the same the religious scriptures for that we christians also can use that <coughs> there we need to be realized about it instead of asking if we can find it in the bible we should ask if we can find it in jesus the ways which we are talking about can we find it in the bible that's what people talk about it's in the bible it's in the bible we need to find answer it's it's not about finding whether it's in the bible or not 
it should, if we need to find if it's in the life of Jesus. If it's in the life of Jesus, go do it. No problem. <laughs> and definitely I can tell you that you won't find that. Jesus won't shower fire on people. He stopped them. And uh, he showers love upon people. Okay. So, many people say, everything is fair in love and war. <laughs> yes, right? Everything is fair in love and war. You can do anything. In Telugu, in, we say, Vey Abadalena, Oga Pelijan. A Pelijas and Marsa Trojo? You can lie a thousand and can get somebody married. Next day they will have issues. And in war, you know what not, what not is happening. <coughs> right? And a lot of people justify it, saying everything is fair in love and war. And many say, the means are justified by the end. There are end results, they will justify the means. Whatever the means you have taken doesn't matter, the end matters. It is not like going to second or bad way, it doesn't matter if you take a train or a bus or a cycle or an auto. It is not like that. It's about lives of people. And people say, end justifies the means. but. The reality will be something different. And even Jesus faced similar, uh, a similar situation in his own life. We can find it in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, when Jesus was tempted. Okay? Uh, where it is, uh, the, this is the last temptation uh, Satan brought to Jesus. Again, the devil took him upon an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Here also Jesus was tempted, right? If you bow down to me, I am going to give all these kingdoms and the glory. Jesus is someone who, is, who came to establish the kingdom of God. He is in fact the king of the entire kingdom. And he was tempted. If you just bow down to me, I'll give you. You don't need to go. In other words, Jesus, you don't need to go through your crucifixion. Jesus, you don't need to go through your death. Jesus, you don't need to go through your burial. You don't need to be in the grave. You don't need to be humiliated. If you just bow down to me, in secret is enough. You don't need to do it in front of everybody. Even in secret, if you just bow down to me, I will give you all these kingdoms and glory publicly. This is the temptation. Uh, the devil brought to Jesus. We can think, ah, why should we suffer all this? It's simple, while personally, you know, in, uh, in remote, we can just bow down and take the kingdom. Don't any of us think? I would think. Okay. <laughs> if I was in that place. Uh, I'm scared of sufferings. Okay. So, I would think, but Jesus, he was strong. He understood end does not justify means but the means justifies the end actually end does not justify the means only but means are equally important as the end in most of the times the means we take becomes the end result especially violence or politics the means which we take to establish something can become our end itself so Jesus said no oh sorry next many say um, church is a synonym for the kingdom of God right is church a synonym for the kingdom of God hmm? answer is some said yes okay the answer is no Excuse me. Okay. We many think church is the kingdom of God. So building the kingdom means building the church. Right? And building the church kingdom means making everybody Christians. Okay? The reality is church is not the kingdom of God. Church and kingdom of God are quite different. 
they're very closely connected if you have any doubts please ask me after the sermon i don't mind speaking about uh, about it and i don't mind taking another sermon on it okay the kingdom of god in is much bigger and it is different from the church how can i say that because it is written in the scripture matthew chapter 16 verse 18 where peter confessed jesus is the uh, son of god and jesus said to him and I, i and i also say to you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church then he said and the gates of hades shall not prevail against it and i will give you the keys of the kingdom if the church is the kingdom what is the point in mentioning twice here differently here jesus said i am going to build the church and i am going to give the keys of the kingdom to the church kingdom is actually much bigger and the church is a physical manifestation of it okay uh, it is not the kingdom and church are not the same and in fact the kingdom of god has been already established the kingdom of god is not going to come jesus did not to preach repent for the kingdom of god god is going to come what did he preach repent for the kingdom of god is at hand the kingdom of god has come that's why you repent that's what jesus preached he did not preach it's going to come in the future and he said he is going to build the church so jesus also is not interested he is not in the business of building the kingdom because the kingdom has been already established okay for he is the king okay if kingdom is not established our songs are of no use yours is the kingdom yours is the glory song and they are, they don't make any sense okay so jesus already established the kingdom and he is in the business of building the church that's what he said jesus preached the kingdom of god is present is a present reality kingdom of god is an existing reality world could not see the kingdom of god because it is not of this world jesus said to nahaka who is this pilot my kingdom is not of this world in other words my kingdom is not in the dimensions uh, not dimension uh, yeah dimensions of the world it is of an added extra dimension that's what he told them and uh, he had given the king keys of the kingdom uh, to the church and church is the physical expression of the spiritual kingdom that has been established kingdom of god is a spiritual reality and the church is a physical manifestation of the kingdom of god church kingdom of god works through the church church is a physical manifestation but the kingdom is much bigger it is like the icebergs we see no the church is like the tip of the iceberg we see it will be on top we can see only a little but down we don't know how deep it is how big it is so the kingdom is so big and church is the physical manifestation of it having said that let's move there are a lot of people who say they are the kingdom builders now christians we talk about it we name our church also uh, kingdom church is what not you know with the words using kingdom glory or power all these things uh, churches we say we are going to establish the kingdom of god church is not called to establish the kingdom of god because it has already been established by god church has been called to represent the kingdom of god representatives they never build any kingdom representatives they don't even go off to war and fight for war they go and speak for a nation that's all they don't go fight for a war and they will establish any kingdom they don't exercise any other authority they just represent that's all so we are the representatives of the kingdom ambassadors of the kingdom of god but we are not the builders of the kingdom of god unfortunately many times we christians think we are called to be builders of the christian kingdom of god and how are we going to establish the kingdom sometimes the question they they raise is by establish by taking capturing the lands for god is establishing the kingdom that's what happened in uh, 9th 10th and 11th century ad they wanted to capture all the land for christians for god but uh, they create they brought violence and they think kingdom of god is uh, bringing christians to government they want to bring uh, christians to be in the power and authority in big positions it's always good to have our people uh, 
take, to take Christian values, I'm not against it. But if you find that as the means to establish the kingdom, that's where the manipulation takes place. <coughs> where we will not be manipulating others, we'll manipulate ourselves. Okay? And we fool ourselves. Some say Christians should be in the business, higher positions in the business. We need to have more and more Christian entrepreneurs. It is good to have Christian entrepreneurs, but if you think Christian entrepreneurs think they, we need to take, we need to grow big so that we can take control over the country or a place, that's where the manipulation takes place. If they want to provide employment for 10 other people, it's well and good, but not to take control. So establishing the kingdom, I think many, I think uh, in economically, Christians should be in power. And something, uh, building more churches is establishing the kingdom. Okay, let me ask you, is capturing the lands, is establishing the kingdom? No. Is uh, g gaining political power or economical power, is establishing the kingdom? No. Is building more and more churches? This is where people have some <laughs> doubt and uh, doubt to accept it. Building more and more churches. If you build more churches, kingdom of God would come. That's what we think. But it would not, because the bane, the foundational principle itself, it's, it went wrong. Church is the physical manifestation of an existing spiritual kingdom. So, it is not. Church acts as a representative ambassadors of the kingdom, uh, living by the values of the kingdom. If you live the, by the values of the kingdom, you are representing the kingdom. By proclaiming the gospel, we are becoming the representatives of the kingdom. How about we go into build the kingdom? Somebody answered very well. Jesus builds his kingdom. I appreciate whoever it is. Jesus, he built the kingdom. Little modification, that's all. Okay? And uh, it is not we who are building his kingdom. And that, how does the kingdom work? As I said, through principles and values. The same thing Jesus gave, uh, sorry, uh, in the parable, Jesus uh, uh, gave the parable, Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, which we read. Another parable, he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. You know, the, uh, we, we cannot see how the yeast works. Yeast doesn't work outwardly. Yeast works inwardly. And it works inwardly and makes it bigger. Actually, mustard seed thing also we have seen. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. If you consider the mustard seed as a church, and he said it, it becomes a plant and a tree. Mustard seed is not going to become least of the seed like this, and it's not, then tomorrow it's going to become supporter, like supporter seed, then next day like mango size, then coconut size seed. It is not, the seed is not going to bigger and bigger, but the seed is going to bring the life within inside whatever is inside and bring it outside then we can see the beautiful tree the kingdom of god is like that it doesn't look outwardly growing bigger and bigger in its very nature but it is going to be transformed somebody mentioned the kingdom of how are we going to establish the kingdom uh, the question is wrong but transformation right so the ch we, if you have hundreds of churches we think kingdom of God is established? No, it is not. It is just like saying mustard seed is becoming bigger and bigger. The kingdom value should come out of the seed where the life comes and becomes the tree. The kingdom is like the east works inwardly, not uh, by our work, not by outside work. And it's, um, that's the reason apostles did not preach about kingdom after the gospels. You go read your scripture from book of Acts. You don't find much references about the kingdom of God verse. You read all the epistles. You don't find references about kingdom of God. And let me tell you, these two guys, James and John, James did not write anything. But John, I guess the devil is fighting against the growth of the kingdom. <laughs> I'm about to close, uh, however. So, apostles did not preach. Can you hear me? Yeah, apostles did not preach much about the kingdom. This John... Who was, uh, who was saying, I'm going to call the fire to come down on this village. You know what? How many times he mentioned the word kingdom? Only two times. And these two times he mentioned while talking about being born again. Not for any other political things. Two times about love. 
being born again he used and in book of revelation you will find there also it is not apostle who established the kingdom it is god established his kingdom and in fact what he the right word he says is in the same grammar is all the kingdoms have become the kingdoms of god it is not god is establishing the kingdom it is that god's kingdom has been actualized and is realized that's all you don't find god establishing the kingdom there also so apostles don't talk, didn't talk much about it the same apostles who asked fire to come down because after the, the holy spirit coming upon them their eyes are open to the new reality of the kingdom that's what jesus said the kingdom of god is within you nobody can say the kingdom of god is in america or canada or in europe or in india because the kingdom of god is within you it is like the life inside the mustard seed and the seed the life has to come out like a plant just as we have seen in the parable after the pentecost john is uh, john is no more son of thunder he became disciple whom jesus loved that's the description we find he uses the word kingdom only twice uh, in entire new testament it is used 80 times in the epistles only 20 times and in those 20 times you know none of the times it is about establishing a true kingdom like the kind of kingdoms we are talking about so in conclusion what i would like to say is the sons of thunder teaches that establishing the kingdom is god's business not our business and we ought to reflect the kingdom values as we as we are its representatives kingdom of god is not about dominion but about love and service and we ought not to be tempted by the various means to see the fullness of the kingdom coming it can be violence it can be political power it can be economical power any kind of influence that tries to control the other person is not the kingdom one kingdom value is we give ourselves into others hands only way uh, the kingdom can be established is by the by god's work in his time by his means through his church as the body reflects the kingdom values and preaches the gospel may god bless you